Thank you very much to Consumers International for uh, welcoming this, uh, this panel. Uh, my name is Eric Duflo, and um, I would like to uh, ask everybody to uh, use the chat box to introduce who you are, from which organization, and where you're joining from. And throughout this session, you may use the chat function to add comments and uh, Q and A's for any uh, questions for the panel. So thank you very much for all of you who are joining today. And we can go to the next slide, I think. So today's uh, panel is going to be about managing and mitigating consumer risks uh, with, you know, in particular on uh, digital finance and, and financial services more broadly. And uh, let me tell you who is uh, joining you today. So that's me with the beard. Uh, I've shaved it, as you can see. And I'm leading uh, CGAP's consumer protection um, work. And uh, I've been working in financial inclusion for the last 27 years. Um, so that's, that's for me. And you can see uh, all the biographies actually in the, uh, in the website of this event. So I'm going to go very quickly in terms of introducing our panelists, and you can see more information in the uh, website. <clears throat> so Laura uh, Briggs Newberry is a consultant for the uh, for the for CGAP, and she has also been a, uh, a regulator in the U.S. before. She has uh, many many years of experience, uh, in particular on consumer protection. Uh, Madjuri is uh, also uh, with is uh, is currently an analyst, financial sector analyst with CGAP, and she has also been a regulator uh, in Zambia, and she's uh, she's doing uh, terrific research at the moment that she will present uh, soon. Mariela uh, is the deputy superintendent of market conduct and financial inclusion in uh, in Peru. She has played numerous roles uh, in Peru, but also on the international scene. She's a member of several uh, organizations uh, working on consumer protection. Juan Carlos uh, is a senior financial sector specialist at CGAP, and he was also a, a supervisor in uh, Peru. And Victorio um, is the uh, founder and president of the uh, Consumer Association, Laban uh, Consumers. And he also was a regulator. So we have a panel here with uh, people who care a lot about consumers, um, who care a lot about consumer associations, of course, and who all have been regulators in the past. So this is a, a fabulous uh, panel. Um, so before we go into the first part of our session, I would like to launch a, a poll. So I'm going to ask Ruby to launch this poll. And the, I'm going to ask you all a question. And the question is, what are the two most prevalent consumer risks in your country when it comes to digital financial services? Please choose two answers out of these. You can tick two boxes. What we mean here by digital financial services is all kinds of financial services that you can access in a digital way. For example, through a normal phone, a traditional phone, a, um, <clears throat> a smartphone, a uh, computer, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that is digital, digitally accessible. So whether it's savings, credit, insurance, payments, um, all these financial services are part of digital financial services. So what do you see as the two biggest um, risks in your country where you come from, frauds, weak transparency, lack of recourse mechanism, or misuse of personal data. Ruby, I don't know how many participants we have. Oh, we have 40 participants, 48, 48 participants, I can see. So maybe when we have at least 20 votes, we can pull the results. So we have 22 now, Eric. We can keep going and keep All going. All right. Well, let's give one more minute and then we will close the poll. That's pretty quick voting this time. Sometimes it takes much longer, so that's great. And we never get 100% of votes, unfortunately. Very good. Let's, let's pull up the results. 
on what people see in their countries. Okay, well, it's quite a large distribution, uh, you know, sort of relatively equal distribution, although we see that fraud is coming up, you know, high and, you know, quite high if you compare with the last one. So fraud, very, very prominent, it seems. Uh, transparency, second, lack of recourse mechanism, third, misuse of personal data. Very interesting. And I think uh, this will resonate with what we're going to see soon. So without further ado, I'm going to ask um, Madri, my colleague, to uh, first focus, focusing on telling us what is the problem in digital financial services in, when it comes to consumer protection? What are the problems? We, need, we want her to set the stage. So Madri, please go on with your short presentation. And then okay. we, can engage, we can engage after with the participants uh, with questions and answers. Okay, thank you very much, Eric, for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So before I take you through the presentation, by the way, my presentation is about the evolving nature and scale of consumer risks in digital finance, and it is based on our recent global research that we conducted at SIGA. So before I take you through the presentation, let me just draw your attention to two stories that I heard recently. The first one happened here in America, to be precise, in California, where a woman lost $18,000. This happened, it was reported on Monday, this week. And this was through a, a Zelle scam. So some people pronounce it as Zelle. So Zelle is an electronic payment service in America, which allows people to send and receive money electronically. Then the other story uh, is about uh, a, a, is one that a friend shared, a friend in Zambia who works for the Ministry of Finance. So he recently shared a story about marketeers in Zambia who don't want to receive payments via mobile money because they, have, they fear being swindled. So you look at these two stories. One is, is happening in a developed country, America. The other one happened in a developing country, which is Zambia. So it shows you that digital finance consumer risk can affect anyone, whether you're in a developed country or a developing one. But then what we need to, to realize is that for inexperienced digital finance consumers, and in most cases, these are found in developing countries. Experiencing digital uh, risks, uh, digital consumer risks may have a devastating impact because they may cause direct financial loss and other harms as well, which may erode their trust and confidence in not just digital finance, but the formal financial sector as well. So I hope by the end of this short presentation, you'll be compelled enough to take proactive steps to mitigate consumer risks for digital finance users, especially the vulnerable ones like the low-income women and people in the rural areas. So in terms of a presentation today, we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, first of all, I'll talk about, um, I'll run you through the objectives of the research, and of course, uh, talk about the methodology that we used. And then I'll briefly share the key findings, including a few specific examples of the risks that we noted. I'll also briefly talk about the risks that affect vulnerable women, in particular, the low-income women. Um, and then uh, draw your attention to over-indebtedness of digital credit users, which is quite complex in the digital era. So in terms of the research objectives, as you can see, first of all, one of our objectives was to assess the quantitative evidence on whether there has been an increase or decrease in consumer risks in digital finance since 2015. But then you realize that for you to quantify something, you first of all need to understand. So that's the, uh, we also two other objectives relate to the nature, the nature of risks. So we wanted to identify if there were new risks that had emerged and uh, also develop a consumer risk typology that is relevant to the evolution of the digital finance ecosystem. Because as you uh, know, uh, since 2015, there've been a lot of uh, new digital finance products uh, then in terms of the methodology, we started with a, a, a review of publications. We reviewed over 130 publications. Then we shared our initial findings with us experts, global experts. Based on their feedback, we, we added more information to the paper and also read additional papers that we've incorporated. So we ended up with the product that you see over there. Uh, moving on, let's move to the next slide, please. So now before I take you to the research findings, allow me to just uh, highlight this important uh, piece of information. So as we talk about consumer risks in digital finance, 
we are not here to discourage you from promoting digital financial services because we know that digital finance is very important. Digital finance has helped unbanked people to connect to the formal financial sector. For instance, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, mobile money is the primary driver of financial inclusion. So we've highlighted a few examples of the benefits of digital finance. We see uh, here that digital finance has ha actually helped low income customers to borrow, to save, and also to receive remittances. And ultimately this has helped to improve their resilience. Uh, and then if you go to our detailed slide deck, we'll share the link to, to the slide deck, or you can go to, to our website, you'll find that digital finance can also increase access to essential services such as education, and even energy, access to electricity. So digital finance is very important, but then if we don't take proactive steps to mitigate the consumer risks for vulnerable digital finance users, all these benefits can be undermined. So consumer risks can also erode consumer trust in digital financial services, and of course the formal financial sector as well. Now, let me take you through the research findings. If we can go to the next slide, please. I'll start with the nature of the risks that we identified. So remember in our research objectives, we wanted to quantify these risks to see if the risks have increased or decreased, but we also wanted to look at the nature. So in terms of the findings, the nature of the risks, we identified 66 consumer risks, but these are not static. As we are speaking right now, we know that there could be new emerging risks as well, but we identified 66 risks and for simplicity, we decided to categorize them into the four broad risk types that you see here. And of course, there are also two cross-cutting types. So the four types are, the first one is fraud. The second one uh, are risks related to data misuse, as you can see. The third one relates to lack of transparency. And the fourth one has to do with inadequate redress mechanisms. Some people call them complaints handling systems. And then of course the two cross-cutting types relate, there are those that relate to agent issues and the last one uh, deals has to do with network downtime. So for the first type, you see the examples that we have here. Um, there are issues such as mobile app fraud, of course they seem to have fraud. There are other issues that we haven't listed here. If you go to the comprehensive deck, you'll see all those. Then for the second risk, risk type, you see examples such as algorithmic bias, of course there are unfair practices, there are issues such as data breaches, and for the third one, here we see issues such as undisclosed fees. And when we look at uh, inadequate redress mechanisms, there are examples such as complex and expensive uh, complaints handling systems. Then for the cross-cutting types, as you know, for the agents, agents are the bankers of the poor. So if you go to Sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, and you're talking about mobile money, you can't mention mobile money minus talking about the agents. So there we've um, noted quite a number of risks such as lack of agent liquidity and issues of agent fraud. And then for the last one, you see examples such as distributed denial of service attacks. These are the risks that relate to network downtime. So now you see if we don't, uh, if you look at these risks, as you will see in the slides that I'll present later, some of these risks are growing and they are growing at a faster pace than the rate of technology adoption. So if we don't do anything about this, we risk losing uh, some of the people who are already uh, formally included through digital finance. So now let's go to the next one while we talk about the next slide, please. While we talk about um, the scale of the risks in terms of the increase and the decrease in risk. So uh, one thing I would like to draw your attention to the arrows. You see there are two different colors. So while we talk about where we have red arrows, it means that we were able to find studies with quantitative information. And so, uh, means that yes, the study mentioned increase or decrease in risk, but then uh, the quantitative information was, was not available. And then where we say not applicable, it means that we did not find uh, quantitative information and we could not make that conclusion. So you see that for the first two risk types, that's a fraud and data misuse, uh, at the, the global, region and country uh, level, the reports indicated that there was overall increase in the risks. But of course, there are a few exceptions. For instance, if you look at the United Arab Emirates, after the central bank did some sensitization, um, seems to have fraud reduced in that country. And then if you look at lack of transparency, uh, you see the orange there, it means that we found anecdotal evidence that the risks increased overall at the global and regional levels, but then at the country level, the information was inconclusive. Then for uh, 
as you will see in the next few slides, I'll give you some examples. Some risks are growing faster, as I mentioned, uh, and this indicates that they may slow down the progress in advancing financial inclusion, or they may, they may even reverse the progress that we've made in advancing financial inclusion. So now let me take you through some of the examples, specific examples, if we can go to the next slide, please. The first one that I would like you to draw your attention to is mobile app fraud. So this one is quite concerning because uh, mobile app fraud is rising faster than mobile app usage. It is concerning because we've noted that most DFS providers are using mobile applications to offer their digital uh, products. But based on data, as you can see from the Outsiers Fraud and Payments Reports, we see that between 2016 and 2020, the share of fraudulent transactions through mobile apps more than doubled. But then if you look at the share of transactions conducted via the mobile apps, this grew by 34%. In addition, there is a study that was conducted in 2020. Uh, it involved 71 countries. It also indicated that the scale and scope of fraudulent and predatory finance mobile apps increased, and especially uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it is also important to note that mobile app fraud is uh, prevalent in populous countries. So for instance, if you look at Asia, we're talking of India. If you go to Africa, we're talking of Nigeria. And then if you go to South America, we are talking of uh, Brazil. So this is really concerning. Uh, then let me take you to the second example. The second example also has to do with fraud. If we can move to the next slide, please. So the next one is about SIM swap fraud. So SIM swap fraud is also concerning because we know that low income uh, customers are actually accessing financial services through their mobile phones. They're using SIM cards. And according to the GSMA, uh, while SIM swap fraud is a global phenomenon, it's frequently observed in developing countries. Unfortunately, we could not find adequate quantitative evidence to assess the global and regional trends. But then you, you look at this example, we got the example of South Africa, where data from the banking industry was available. So in South Africa, we found that between 2017 and 2020, SIM swap fraud increased by over 200%. And then you will see that the mob, mobile cellular subscribers went up by just 8.4%. Uh, then it is also important to note that the mobile channel accounted for more than 90% of the SIM swap fraud incidents that happened in South Africa. So this is also really concerning. Uh, so let me take you to the last example. The last example has to do with uh, uh, the issue of data misuse. So we'll just highlight one example that has to do with data breaches. If we can go to the next slide. So for data breaches, we found that between uh, 2017 and 2020, data breaches recorded an annual average increase of 80%. Well, the annual increase in data created was 38%. This is also concerning. Uh, because we see again, according to IBM, that the average time to identify and contain a data breach has increased between 2017 and 2021. So in 2021, this went to 287 days, whilst in 2017, it was at 257 days. So um, let me now take you through some of the risks that affect vulnerable customers. And for this one, uh, we've just picked one. If we can go to the next slide, please, we'll talk about low income women. So for the purpose of this research, the way we've defined vulnerable customers, we're looking at low-income people who are not able to access financial services or those who are less safe by the formal financial service providers. So in this case, we'll just give one example, the low-income women. So for low-income women, what we found is that uh, women experience most of the risks more than men. And this is mainly because they have lower digital and financial literacy skills. So we see, if we can go to the next slide, please. In the next slide here, you see, these are some of the examples of the risks that women experience. So I'll just talk about uh, two or three. So for instance, according to evidence from China, women uh, are more likely to suffer losses in a Ponzi scheme. Then we also see evidence from Ghana, uh, as it relates to agents, women are more likely to, be, to, to suffer misconduct as they deal with agents. But then there's uh, something interesting about the Ghana uh, study, because in that study, they also found that female agents are the ones who are more likely to defraud female customers. Because I know some people are advocating that we should have more female customers to serve a female clients. So this is really surprising. But uh, anyway, we just found one example. Uh, so maybe it's worth researching further in other countries if this is true. 
Uh, so last but not the least, let's talk about over indebtedness, which has also become quite complex in the digital era. If we can move to the next slide, please. So uh, over indebtedness is becoming more complex. We know that even traditional finance and traditional finance, this is an issue, but for digital credit, it's more concerning because digital credit is fast. And if you look at the loans that are given, they are quite small. So if we can go to the next uh, slide, we look at the example of Kenya. So in Kenya, for instance, we see, uh, we see in, in the case of Kenya, we've come to a conclusion that digital lenders are more likely to fuel and help to borrowing that results in higher default rates. So in this case, you see, for instance, digital borrowers defaulted at a rate of 21% of the digital borrowers defaulted. Then if you compare with uh, the non-digital borrowers, uh, the rate is at 6.9%. Now compare that even with just the informal borrowers. I know a lot of people uh, talk about informal borrowers, in, informal lenders to be the problem. But in this case, you see that even for informal borrowers, the default rate was 15.9%. So uh, we see that actually consumers who use uh, mobile apps are more likely to default. So mobile uh, credit provided through mobile, mobile apps uh, is actually more dangerous or more concerning. Uh, then the other point to note here is that most of these loans are actually, actually very small. So in the case of uh, Kenya, you see that almost 50% of the digital borrowers had outstanding balances of less than $10. So in the last slide, I'll just uh, show you if we can go to the last slide as we talk about over indebtedness. So within our framework, if you look at the last slide, we are saying that uh, digital credit consumers face multiple risks that we've uh, identified in our framework. So you see, for instance, uh, when a desperate digital borrower uses a fraudulent lending app, they may, may be compelled to provide more data. So that's a data misuse issue than what is necessary. And once that data is provided, the lender, or in most cases, the agent uh, engaged by the lender will start calling the borrower repeatedly in case they fail to pay on time. Or in extreme cases, they actually uh, access the address book and they'll start ca calling the borrower's uh, close friends, in some cases, relatives as well, which is a breach of trust. In extreme cases, as was the case in, in China in 2016, uh, young female students were forced to share nude photos as collateral if they failed to repay the loans. So, and then what is also worth noting is that these digital lenders do not have proper recourse channels or complaints handling channels. So even in a case where a customer realizes that they made a mistake, they may try to contact them, but they will fail to renegotiate re re the loan terms. So due to the pressure to repay the existing loans, they end up getting additional loans and they find themselves in a situation that, that they just borrow to repay existing loans. And this leads to negative coping mechanisms such as skipping meals. In some cases, people pull their children out of school. In extreme situations, as we heard reports in uh, India, people committed suicide. So these are really concerning issues. So one point I would like you to take away from uh, this discussion or from this presentation is that digital uh, consumer risks are growing and they're growing really fast. If we don't do uh, anything about these risks, if we don't mitigate them, we may end up slowing down the progress or even reversing the progress that we've made in financial inclusion. So at this stage, I'll hand back to Eric. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Madhuri. You're just one minute over, so that's perfect to get a gold medal for giving us an enormous amount of information in a limited amount of time. Thank you so much, Madhuri. So um, I think, um, one thing I wanted to say is that I was looking at the chat and we have four continents represented in the participants, which is great. We have uh, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Europe. Um, I won't mention all the countries. You can see it in the chat. Also, I want to say that uh, I didn't introduce uh, CGAP uh, and I won't do a long one on this one, but just wanted to mention that we are an international knowledge center that is housed at the World Bank and we focused exclusively on improving financial inclusion for the poor, especially women. So just for those of you who don't know who we are. Thank you so much. So I think uh, we're going to um, start. Oh, we have a fourth continent here. Thank you, North America. So um, a fifth, sorry. So now let's move to the questions. We have a few minutes. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions from the audience, so I invite you to um, ask your question to Madri in the chat. 
on this uh, landscape of digital finance consumer risks. So please write your question in the chat. If there is no question coming, I'm going to ask question, but I would much prefer participants to ask them. So please write your questions in the chat. I have one question for you, Madri. You've told us about the specific risks for women. Can you say anything about uh, the rural poor? Do we have you know, information from the research on that front? Okay, thank you very much for that question, um, Eric. So in terms of the vulnerable segments, like I said, we looked at two groups specifically, the uh, low income women and the rural areas. So what we found for the rural areas, the risks they face are similar to women, but then the challenging part is that we could not find enough disaggregated data. So you can see that even in the case of women, we've not assessed the evolution of the risks. We just identified the issues. So for the rural areas, another issue that we found is that in most countries, most developing countries, actually people are not using digital finance. Cash is still king. So we found a few studies that talked about the issues, but those were very few. So uh, women and rural populations face similar risks. And what amplifies the risk for the rural populations, just like uh, for the women, it's the issue of having low financial and digital skills. So if you go to the rural areas, it's even worse for, the, for rural women. So if you're a woman and then you also live in a rural area, uh, that, that is actually more challenging because um, even the financial service providers, they have fewer financial service providers in rural areas. So uh, for instance, even agents, agents in most cases are found in the urban and very urban areas. So those are some of the issues that we highlighted. So now we're getting a flow of questions, Madri. So you have to be very concise so that we can deal with all of them. The first one is a question from Gopal Ratnam. Um, his question was, why is digital consumers more likely to default? I think this is referring to the digital credits. Why, is digital cons why are digital consumers more likely to default, Madri? Okay, thank you for that question. So uh, what we found, according to the evidence that we've gathered in several countries, so uh, if you look at East Africa, and of course, even in Asia, you look at India, one of the issues is the lack of transparency. And actually, according to research that we conducted earlier on at SIGAP, we conducted research in Kenya and in Tanzania, we found that there is a correlation between lack of transparency and uh, default. So that's one of the issues. So if you see, if you look at digital credit, this is credit which is um, dispersed within minutes, like maybe even within a minute or two minutes, someone is able to get a loan. So in most cases, if people are desperate, they don't get to read the terms and conditions and they end up getting very expensive loans. So based on our recent research again in India, we found that in some cases, the loans at interest rates as high as 1,200%. So it's unsustainable, even if you're doing a business, you can't make a return of over a thousand percent. Yeah, so that's one of the main issues is the issue of lack of transparency. But of course, as you have seen, even in our framework, there are other issues as well. Some of the credit that they're accessing is actually coming from uh, fraudulent lenders. So uh, those are more likely to uh, put pressure on customers. And in some cases, if a system is down, as you saw within our framework, people may try to repay. Uh, they think that the payment has gone through, but if a system is down, maybe it hasn't, and they just realize that they defaulted on the loan. So those are some of the issues. If you want to learn more, maybe you can read our comprehensive deck. We'll share the, the link in the chat. So thank you. Very good. Uh, there are more questions coming. So are the online, are the online site operators presenting as largely domestic or as international businesses? So have you found that... I'm interpreting this question, but I hope I'm interpreting it well, is are the operators mostly domestic or international in the research? The um, are you referring to digital lenders yes. or well, just TFS? I, okay, in general. It's not mentioned in the question, so I think we can maybe speak broadly about the DFS providers. Okay, so broadly about digital finance, in most cases, it's both actually, the domestic and international. So what we found like in the case of uh, India, some of these uh, operators or digital lenders, the fraudulent ones were coming from neighboring countries. 
Yeah, so it's both the domestic and international. Very good. There's another question. In DFS, transfers move from one customer to another. Why is it difficult for providers to trace fraudulent transfers? That's not an easy one. <laughs> okay, the providers would be in a better place to answer that question. Uh, no. But uh, what we've noted from the research again is that the risks are becoming more complex. So if you take, for instance, you talk about social engineering. In the past, people would just talk about phishing. Phishing, which is like, um, it's, it's fraud uh, through your, your, your computer. But in recent times now, we've seen people coming up with things like phishing, where they, people start calling you. Like the example that I gave in the, in the case of that woman in California. People started calling her and they sounded like they were genuine people from the bank. They even sent her messages. The messages look so genuine. So it's because the risks have become more complex. So like I indicated again in the research, even the time to pick up some of these issues has also increased by 30 days. If you compare in 2017, as I said, institutions were taking 257 days to pick up the issues, but it's now taking 287 days. So it's the issue of complexity. But I wish maybe, maybe a service provider would be in a better place to answer the question. Yeah. Very good. So we have one last question, but which I'm not sure we will be able to answer it because it's quite a comprehensive one. So thanks for Ken and Felicia for your questions. Antonino was asking, do you think that DFS is prompting the need to look at over-indebtedness as a cross-border issue? And if a consumer needs to use relief mechanisms for their debt, judges and administrative authorities should look wider and include those debts from abroad to set the debt ease? And if so, how it can be done amid regulation that is not considering, oops, generally the situation. So I think it's the notion of, you know, I, I think you've seen some of, the, some of this cross-border debt, but it's very complex. Any, any thought on this before we conclude? Yeah, that's a very Andrew? complex issue. So yesterday there was another session for those who tuned in where they were talking about over-indebtedness. There was a session yesterday. So it has to do with, yes, of course, we can look at cross-border issues, but even domestically, what are we doing about uh, the regulatory environment? So we've noted in some countries, they've developed legal frameworks to deal with such issues, but they are not adequate. Where is the enforcement? So it's, it's actually quite complex if we take it across, across the border. I'll end here for, for now. I think, hey, I hope I thank you very question. much. I think <laughs> we're going to stop here and move to the next uh, section, the second section of, the, uh, of this panel, which is going to be about presenting innovative solutions and collaboration across stakeholders. So um, let us first go through, Ruby, if you can pull up the, the poll, please. We're going to do a poll. So the question is, what do you think are the best two ways for your organizations to mitigate the DFS consumer risks that Madri has just presented very nicely? And you can check two boxes here. I won't read all the answers because you can see them on your screen. Okay, when we're over 20, 20, 20, 22, over 22, we can, how many do we have, Ruby or Matthew? We have 25 currently. 25, okay. Oh, 27, 28. Okay, we can, we can go ahead and show the results. Oh, wow, okay, very interesting. So it's a very distributed, I would say the winner here is regular discussion with regulator to revise and or adopt regulations to market situation. So that's the winner. Uh, the peer learning is not so high, surprisingly, to my surprise, I have to say, because I've seen some really excellent work done on the peer learning among consumer associations. Um, 
but that's you know really interesting to hear from all of you. So consumer research comes second, I would say, after regular discussion with regulators. Well, the good news is that this panel is made of regulators, so we can start here and have more discussions. So please, uh, you're going to be able to ask a lot of questions to these regulators in or former regulators in the chat. Thank you very much. So let's uh, switch to the next uh, the next panelist. So I'm going to invite Juan Carlos uh, to tell us a bit more about the market monitoring toolkit for supervisors and consumer associations. And we thank you very much. Presentation yeah. for him. Yes. <laughs> And um, my warm regards to all the participants in this panel as part of the Fair Digital Finance Forum 2022. In the next few minutes, I'd like to share with you the online market monitoring toolkit that CGAP has just released this year, just a couple of months ago. We believe that this toolkit can be very helpful to not only financial consumer protection authorities, but also a range of other stakeholders, including consumer associations. But the toolkit aims to raise awareness on the importance of carrying out market monitoring activities to support customer-centric consumer protection. And as a reminder, market monitoring is an activity that really helps to identify, understand, and track industry developments and consumer risks and consumer behavior at the market level. So market monitoring shifts the focus from individual providers' actions to financial consumer experiences across multiple providers in a sector or a market. So by taking a broader look at a sector and its consumers, market monitoring is especially useful in the current digital financial sector development, as it contributes to identify innovative products and services and how consumers are using and benefiting from them. Now, the next slide, I would like to uh, summarize the outline of the toolkit. The toolkit starts with a, an introduction that briefly focuses on the benefits of market monitoring. Then the second part provides detailed guidance on the use of a range of practical monitoring tools. In particular, we focus on these eight tools that you see in the screen analysis of regulatory reports, especially from the perspective of the Consumer Protection Authority or the Financial Sector Supervisory Authority, analysis of complaints data that applies to uh, consumer protection authorities, but also ombudsman and even consumer associations, fund surveys, social media monitoring, analysis of consumer contracts, mystery shopping, all of these also apply to a range of stakeholders. Industry engagement that primarily relates to how the financial sector authorities engage with the industry representatives, the industry associations, financial sector uh, providers associations, and then thematic reviews, which uh, particularly relate to how the financial sector authorities look at a range of issues in the market, but can also be applied by consumer associations that can look at specific topics from a market perspective. So the guidance of each, of how to implement each of these two is included in different pages of the market monitoring tool. And I'll later on show you an example of how you can look at these tools within the tool. The next section of the toolkit is the country cases. Here we illustrate how the tools have been implemented in a specific context. Right now we have six country cases from a range of markets, um, including Kenya, Tanzania, uh, also uh, Ireland, Portugal, and other countries. And each one illustrates a different kind of tool and goes into detail of how they were implemented in each country. And I'll also show you in more detail how we do this. A fourth section focuses more on the practical actions that supervisors can take 
to incorporate and apply and adopt these tools, uh, including how they can actually position market monitoring as part of their supervisory activities. We also have a section on how other stakeholders, such as consumer associations, can incorporate and play a role in supporting the adoption of market monitoring tools to capture, analyze, and publish information on market monitoring issues to the market. Then we also have a section on further resources. And I think this is also a useful section for the consumer associations. Here, we include a, frequent, a set of frequently asked questions around what is market monitoring, how market monitoring fits a range of uh, different types of activities, how different uh, players can play a role in contributing to market monitoring, what are the benefits of market monitoring, et cetera. We also have a section of frequently asked questions around subtech or the use of technology to support gathering data on market monitoring. We have a section also to illustrate what standard setters and other global bodies say on the importance of market monitoring, which can help consumer advocacy groups to promote the use of market monitoring in a country. This can give you more tools on why authorities can really implement and promote the use of market monitoring tools within a jurisdiction. So now I would like to share with you actually how uh, you can take better use of the toolkit. So I would like to go over and share my screen right now uh, and uh, show you the uh, specific uh, toolkit. Let's see, I believe you can share, you can see now. Um, so. And you have three minutes, Juan Carlos. Yes, so quickly, just this gives you a flavor of how the toolkit is presented in our website. First, you have an introduction that primarily benefits, shows the benefits of the market monitoring uh, activities. Then you have this important part, the section of the market monitoring tools, where you can look at the different objectives for market monitoring and then identify which tool fits better each objective. And then you can go and go deeper into the different tools. We have eight tools right now. We can, we are thinking of expanding the number of tools in the future, but right now we have, you can choose among eight tools. For example, in phone surveys, you have those different sections. You can show, you can see the benefits of and opportunities of using a phone survey. You can go in more detail about the characteristics of this phone survey tool. You also have for each tool, these different steps on how you can implement this specific tool. And now go in more detail about each of these steps. And then each of the two sections also have a reflection on the limitations of the tool and the challenges of implementing this tool. So uh, you also have uh, the option of downloading this information through a PDF and not only looking at it online through your computer or your uh, mobile phone. And then you have the option of going deeper into the different country cases. And as you can see, we have different ways of looking at each of the country cases. Um, and then click on each uh, country case and you can see for each country case, both background, purposes and incentives of why the tool was implemented in a specific country and more specific details around the methodology and the data ecosystem for implementing that specific tool, the type of requirements for implementing that tool, what would be reference aspects of vendor selection and cost. We even have some supplementary materials on the terms of reference. And then some reflections on the benefits and impact as well as the limitations and implementation challenges of this specific case on each country. And then, as I said, 
uh, in the take action section, you can go and check what are some reflections on how market monitoring tools can be supported by different stakeholders, including the consumer advocacy groups. So this is just a quick uh, reflection on how you can see all of these in the toolkit. And I'll be happy, of course, to um, address any questions you may have around this, this tool. Thanks. Thank you so much, Juan Carlos, for this great presentation. And um, you're definitely getting a gold medal here for pulling two years of work into eight minutes. <laughs> so, and if any participants have some, you know, questions here or even after, you can contact, you know, Juan Carlos. He will be delighted to have a one-on-one -on -one to explain to you, you know, more about the uh, the tool. So. Um, we're going to move to uh, Victorio now, who uh, is extremely kind to speak today because you can imagine how late it is in Hi. the Philippines. So thank you so much, Victorio. And we're going to ask you to share your experience in the Philippines as a uh, consumer protection advocate yourself, leading a, a major consumer association. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, uh... It depends on where we are at the moment. I can greet you good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I can greet you also good early morning in the Philippines. Anyway, uh, uh, we, we in the Philippines have launched a six-year program, which we call uh, the National Strategy for Financial Inclusion, uh, 2022 to 2028. After hearing the first presentation on the risk to consumers of digital finance, uh, our inclusion program is not very far from what we in the Philippines should also be doing. Next slide, please. There are four pillars of the National Strategy for Financial Inclusion and involves four stakeholders in the government. Uh, can you go to the four? These are the government, the consumer groups, the consumers themselves, and the private business. You will see in this particular uh, circle the financial inclusion program will deal on financial capable and empowered consumers, improve financial health and efficiency. Reduce disparities in financial inclusion and increase access to finance by MSMEs, including startups and uh, small businesses. Next slide, please. There you are. These are the four pillars of what we propose to do over the next six years. And you will see in items two and three, this is where our consumer association was invited to be a member of a working group whose task for the, the next six years is to strengthen financial education and consumer protection and enhance access to risk protection and social safety nets. So the first two speakers talk about risk um, and basically risk to consumers in the Philippines we will address that risk through a standard financial education and consumer protection and enhancing access to risk protection and social safety nets. The, the organizational structure of the working group is uh, multi-sectoral, including not only government regulators, not only the central bank, but other government agencies and also business sectors, more important, and I would like to emphasize uh, this, uh, uh, the greater yes. role given to yes. consumer yes. associations uh, yes. in this particular uh, yes. financial yes. education and consumer protection agency. Yes. Next slide, please. Yes. 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 So if, if, you, if you want
On mute, uh, Victorio. All right. Sorry, I want, I want to repeat. This year will, will show to you uh, what we are supposed to do over the next six years. We have started it this year by launching the program in January. And, uh, and uh, I just like to emphasize that consumer association will be more in the area of more empowered consumer and uh, financial education and financial education. I think that's about all uh, my presentation for the Philippines. I just gave you a broad overview of what we will be doing in terms of consumer protection uh, in, in the digital financial services. Thank you and good day to all of you. Thank you very much, Victorio. Thank you. Very good. And it's amazing to see uh, that you have been so active in this uh, national financial inclusion strategy that is very important for Filipino consumers. Um, I'm now going to call, uh, and you're definitely getting the gold medal, Victoria, for staying up so late and being the most devoted consumer advocate in this uh, panel. Um, I'm now going to call uh, Laura uh, to tell us a bit more about consumer adv advisory panels that are starting to emerge in uh, different countries. So Laura, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. It's, it's great to be here with all of you today to talk about CGAP's work on consumer advisory panels. I don't have any slides, so if there's anything you'd like to me to repeat or explain, um, you know, just drop a message in the chat and someone can flag me down and I'm happy to go back over it again. But CGAP has um, identified this as a really promising way to elevate the collective consumer voice in the countries where we work. And I'd like to start by briefly just um, describing what we mean by consumer advisory panels for those of you who may not be familiar with this term. So what this is, it's a group of consumer experts. We have consumer associations, legal aid, academia, government, um, sometimes responsible providers and the media will participate. And they convene on a regular basis with the regulator to exchange information and to discuss emerging consumer risks in financial services. So there's some really great benefits to this kind of an engagement. It serves as a bridge between authorities and consumer advocates, but ensures a steady flow of information in both directions. And this is really critical in a fast moving field like digital finance. Marjorie covered a large number of risks. I mean, it really makes my head spin to think of all of the different issues and challenges that are there. So, you know, having this consistent engagement is really, really helpful to stay on top of these. It also allows regulators and supervisors to hear from consumers they wouldn't normally hear from. Those are less likely, for example, to engage directly through complaints or by posting a public comment to a proposed rule. And it also provides a dedicated space to focus on consumer issues with the regulator, which helps to level the playing field in a sector where providers usually have a stronger voice and a lot more influence than their customers do. So one thing we noticed in our early research on consumer panels is that these are not very common in low and middle income countries where CGAP normally works. So we set out to determine what it would take for countries to develop a consumer panel of their own. So our work has two main components. This is still very much work in progress. So I'm just giving you a little flavor of it today. Um, first, we're doing a global scan of existing consumer panels to see how they're organized and operate. And then we're also doing a pilot with a, a financial conduct authority to help them uh, develop their own consumer panel from the ground up, which has been really interesting for us just to follow in real time the process and some of the questions that come up along the way. So a little bit on the global scan, this is just a series of interviews. I think we've done around 14 so far, um, speaking with countries that have a panel to identify some of the common features and the good practices. And we're still synthesizing all these results, but two high level takeaways is that all of the interviews have really confirmed that this consumer panel mechanism is a really valuable tool in the consumer protection toolkit. Authorities gain a lot deeper insights into consumer issues than they would normally have, which helps them do their jobs better. Consumer groups have an effective channel to share information, to learn about policy priorities, and participate in strategic discussions that affect the financial health of consumers. 
We also found that getting started was not as heavy a lift as we originally thought. This does not have to be super formal or expensive or time consuming to be effective. You can start small and still reap the benefits. What's important here is developing the relationships and the regular flow of information. Uh, a little bit about our pilot. So we are uh, facilitating a pilot that connects the South Africa Financial Sector Conduct Authority with the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK and their financial services consumer panel. So how this came about is that South Africa wanted to create a consumer panel. And we knew from our earlier research that the UK panel was one of the best examples around of how this is done. So it felt like a natural fit to bring them together for a series of discussions so South Africa could learn from the UK experience. And we were all really clear from the start, this was not about transplanting the UK model to South Africa. How this works is really the UK has served as a sounding board for South Africa to talk through questions and weigh different options. CGAP also supported a formal stakeholder analysis to help South Africa better understand the consumer landscape. Um, and looking at just the relative interest, uh, influence and capacity of different consumer groups. So South Africa is making really great strides in developing their panel and we're looking forward to them launching sometime next year. And we've also just been really encouraged generally by the results of the pilot. And we would really love to see more of this kind of peer learning uh, experience. So I'll just close by saying that, again, we're very optimistic about the potential for these panels to elevate the collective consumer voice in digital finance. And we'll be sharing more of these findings in the coming months. Uh, if you have comments or questions about our research, we would love to hear from you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. And uh, you're also getting a gold medal, of course, um, for presenting without PowerPoints in a very concise and clear way. So thank you very much. Very inspiring. And I think these uh, consumer uh, consultative uh, uh, panels are really going to grow, I expect, because they are, they're not, they're not super complicated and they're not super costly and they're a great means for regulators to keep in touch on a very regular basis with consumer representatives. So uh, I hope we see more of these, you know, mushroom uh, globally in the future, because that would be great to establish a, uh, a formal dialogue, let's put it this way, which was really one of the issues that was highlighted at the beginning, if you remember of this session, that this is one thing that our participants here uh, mentioned. And by the way, the participants also get a gold medal here because there is an increasing number of them, which is very unusual. Usually when we have a panel, there is less and less participants, but I guess people are talking with each other and bringing more participants into the, the, the discussion. So that's fantastic. All right, so let's move to Peru. Um, Mariela is going to present something very interesting happening in, in her country. So I'll give her the floor. She can explain to you what she's doing in collaboration with uh, another regulatory organization. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and give me the opportunity to share the Peruvian experience. First of all, next slide, please. I just want to say that in many cases, it depends the way the, the legal framework of a country. In the case of Peru, there are two institutions that are part of the uh, consumer protection uh, institutional frameworks. On one side is the superintendents of banking insurance and, and private pension funds, that is the financial regulator. Uh, and on the other side is, is the in the copy, that is the general consumer protection agencies. Uh, both institutions that have to coordinate in order just to, to keep the, the market in order, but uh, we have different mandates, we have a different uh, legal framework, and uh, at the end, some kind of different objective, but we are looking for a safe market, including all the stakeholders for the case of the SBS, just focusing on market conduct, uh, just trying that uh, in the market, there are uh, following the market following good practices, eliminating any abusive uh, practices, and then the copy focus on consumer disputes resolution, uh, basically. Next slides, please. Because of, of this new environment that we are presented, the digital environment, uh, it's time that 
all institutions have to coordinate. I mean, the regulator in the past, financial regulator, only has to coordinate probably in the case of Peru with the Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank. However, now the, 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 the world is changing. We have to coordinate with the telecommunication agencies, with the Ministry of uh, Telecommunication, uh, also uh, Ministry of Education, and in the case of, of consumer protection with the, in the copy. So in that sense, we uh, develop as a country two uh, national policies for financial inclusion. One of them were, in, uh, were enacted by a Supreme Decree in 2015. However, it was improved and changed because of digital environment in 2019, including five specific objectives. One of them, the, three, the third one, is focused on the mitigating market friction. Just trying to give confidence to people, objective one on financial education, including a, a digital financial education, and the objective three, focusing mainly uh, in give a sound market, um, uh, a sound financial market. So one measure that is including here is a coordination with the in the copy superintendents and in the copy have to coordinate together in order to give more. Uh, to be more predict, uh, uh, more pre uh, predictive <laughs> to to the market. So not only institutions have clear rules that were developed by the regulator by the superintendents, but also uh, rules that how we implemented them in the market. So both of them, both institutions have different initiatives to listening uh, consumers for develop re uh, the regulator the regulation in the case of the superintendents or in the case of in the copy, just to, to see if there is some kind of uh, frictions of the, in the market and uh, if, if they have to impose any sanction because of uh, non, the accomplishment of uh, the, financial regulation, the financial regulation. So in that sense, uh, there were a confusion for people. People didn't know if they have to go to the superintendents to solve their complaints or they have to go to in the copy. So the, and it just affect the confidence on the system as a whole. So in that sense, next slide, please. We just sit together and analyze uh, how can we improve the way we were working in the past. Uh, the superintendents receive different uh, sources or have different sources of information. Financial entities uh, report to us uh, monthly, quarterly, or uh, even though a uh, daily information about their complaints, the, the products, the number of clients, etc. But we also receive information from in the copy. However, in a, a structure that is a very complicated to be analyzed by, by the superintendents because we use different terms. Uh, we, uh, um, we use different interpretations also of the different norms. So it was very, very complicated to hard. To, to work with this information. And in the case of superintendents, we have uh, monitoring the market using social uh, media, uh, receiving uh, inquiries directly in our platform to give information to people, uh, orientated them how the institutions work, uh, financial institutions work, how the product and services uh, work, especially in this digital environment. So, uh, with all of this, of these institutions, this, the, we as a regulator and supervisor develop some kind of uh, observations to institutions and give them mandatory recommendations. We follow up them, application sanctions against misconduct, and uh, um, we continually review our regulation. Actually, here um, we listen or I listen how a regulators be, have to be informed about what happened in the market. And the, the client voice is a very, very important uh, source to develop this regulation. We just also have these, these tools like uh, mystery shopping, these, as, as mentioned, social media. We open our platforms to receive more than uh, 1 million uh, people uh, um, questions about how uh, institutions work. So with all this information and just giving them, we just move to this project, try to work together within the copy, trying to just keep away our uh, um, conflicts we have in the way we, we have to deal with the problem in, in order to have a safe market. Next slide, please. 
And in that sense, we have important funding with the, with the project that started last year with the support of SIGAP. Actually, we find that both entities use technology just to listen people, but in different ways. We uh, didn't coordinate in the past uh, what we have to listen, what we have to do, uh, which kind of information is important. Actually, they, they uh, in the copy collect information. We collect in other cases, uh, in some cases, the same information, in other cases, additional information, but we don't, don't have a real way to uh, coordinate and use both institutions the information that's a public institution we are collecting. Uh, on the other side, uh, we uh, receive, uses different technology, use to, uh, our processes were highly manual, and uh, we have very, very uh, difficulties to deal with the with information that were collected by both institutions. No? In that sense, we have uh, four important recommendations. It's a single registration window for people. The people don't have to, uh, to know where to go as public sector. They just go from one window and we just prepare uh, in, in the back an architecture to work together using, and, and um, because of our mandates, each of them has to use this information in different ways. However, in many cases, there is the same information. So um, now people could, could just go to one institution and, autom and automatically they just move to the institutions, to both institutions to be used in different ways. No? Uh, we have to collaborate and uh, using technology, uh, we also have to interoperate both platforms to share information, the information we collected, we also have to share to in the copy the, the information we collected use, uh, that were reported by uh, a financial institutions. It not sense that financial institutions have to send the same information to two public institutions. We have to coordinate inside the market also. And uh, because of, the, of that, when we review the information that were collected by the other institutions, what we saw is that we can uh, have new knowledge, we can have a better understanding what is happening in the market and what is happening with the people and about also their expectations, especially in this digital environment that uh, we both institutions are very concerned about the risk you have uh, already mentioned. There are frauds, there are over indebtedness, and how to deal with this risk working together instead of competing also uh, both institutions in the market. Uh, ne next slide. And finally, uh, just to say, we are working on this big project, big project trying to have this window uh, capture information of different channels, but at this time working together. Um, and the next step is, is mainly uh, this year, we plan to, um, to build the architecture, the data architecture we need to interoperate uh, or do an asset interoperability assessment, both institutions, so that next year we can just develop and implement uh, the project that we uh, consider is very important. Uh, the, the Minister Council is involved on that. There are 10 different public institutions working together and uh, supporting this kind of project, uh, just trying to uh, give people uh, the confidence to work with financial services and to uh, a better well-being for them is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mariela. That was a great presentation. And um, if I were to give you a gold medal, uh, it would be for collaboration. And I think it's incredibly important for building a responsible digital financial uh, sector to have this type of collaboration. Uh, collaboration among you know, regulators, like you highlighted. And one thing that I found particularly interesting is the, you know, when you started to say, well, you know, we were not speaking exactly the same language. And this is exactly what collaboration is about. It's about learning how to speak the same language. And I think it's the same issue sometimes that we see uh, coming back to this, you know, um, instruments that participants voted for this dialogue with regulator. Sometimes we don't all speak the same language. Consumer associations, you know, they have different type of, you know, of staff than regulator, so they may not speak exactly the same language. 
getting on a common understanding, I think, is a huge, huge progress that you are making in, in Peru and uh, that we need to see more in other countries. So uh, originally, I was going to ask the panelists a lot of questions, but I want to give priority to our participants. So I'm changing the plans a little bit. And we're going to take a few questions from the panelists because I think there are some really, really interesting ones. Um, maybe I'll start with the one that, and you know, there is the chat and there's the Q&A chat. So it's a bit difficult to manage, but there was a really interesting uh, question on soup tech. And uh, maybe uh, Juan Carlos, do you want to give a quick uh, thought on this? And you know, we can ask we'll see Mariela to, to add if she wants, but um, I'll let you speak because this is something we discuss very often. Indeed, and I think this is a very important point. And we've incorporated several messages around subtech in our market monitoring toolkit. It's starting with, I think, an important message is how to use subtech effectively so that resources to implement subtech tools are well spent. Uh, so that and please subtech... explain to people what subtech is because I'm not sure everybody knows. <laughs> Good point. So okay, great point. Thanks for the reminder. Yeah, so subtech is primarily the use of new types of technology, um, including artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, sometimes chatbots, etc. So new types of technology to help supervisors and supervisors and also other market monitoring stakeholders on identifying consumer risks, identifying risks in general in the financial sector. So technology, use of technology for supervisory purposes, for monitoring purposes. So we believe that subtech is here to stay and subtech is really important. At the same time, we believe that it's important for supervisors, for authority to have fundamentals in place <laughs> so that they can effectively, more effectively use subtech. Uh, otherwise, what you can see is that the authorities or the other stakeholders just use subtech in a way randomly and as a pilot and as a one-off exercise instead of incorporating subtech into a much more comprehensive strategy for uh, monitoring the market and for supervisory purposes. So based on that, Subtech, yes, can be very useful and can be really important to monitor, especially new developments uh, and qualitative information from a consumer protection side. This, at the same time, we are seeing that these are working progress. And several, there are several initiatives to see how these tools can be uh, used by developing countries in a more cost-effective manner. The World Bank, Gates Foundation, other funders. Um, there is a global a financial innovation network uh, that groups multiple supervisory authorities. All of them are developing and trying to pilot new solutions. And what entities like the World Bank, CCAP is trying to do is to share lessons based on those pilots to see how to the tools can be implemented. Kind of share what are the pros and cons what are the challenges so that different developing countries can build on those lessons? Thank you, Juan Carlos. So now, um, Mariana, do you want to add anything on this or we can move to another question? Let me know. Probably only just to add that subtech is now, it currently is not something we have to, to think if we implement or not. We have to. And the only way, the, the only question is how, <laughs> how to do it effectively. Thank you. Um, if Victorio is still available for a question, I'd like to ask him a question that was put in the in the chat earlier. Is you know how how can the consumer associations what can they do to help prevent some of the DFS risks that have been described at the beginning? Are there specific actions that that consumer associations can take, Victorio? If you can tell us briefly, only if you are available. Can I answer the question now? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you, Victorio. Okay. Uh, the terms and conditions of uh, our engagement in this uh, inclusion, in this inclusion strategy project uh, over the next few six years will be defined. In a, Can you speak a bit louder, project. Victorio? It's it's hard to hear. Say it again. All right. Can you speak I mean, louder, the please? The terms and conditions of our participation in the national strategy for financial inclusion, especially in the area of the literacy and education campaign, will be defined in a working group structure that is being organized at the moment. So, uh, as I said, this is a pioneering activity for consumer association in the Philippines, being engaged by the regulators in this area of financial, digital financial or e-wallet economy. So we are very optimistic that uh, we should be able to contribute our expertise, our expertise, our uh, relationships with consumers. And uh, I think we can tell them the different classes of consumers in the Philippines, just who are ready to do the digital financial help desk also in a Freddy and, uh, and things like that. And particularly uh, in the Philippines, uh, the statistics shows that about six or seven people still did not maintain a bank account. So uh, uh, I guess uh, that's a big challenge for digital financial program uh, in a country like this. So, uh, but I, I'm, I'm very thankful that you, you were asked to join. You were asked to join this particular inclusion strategy activity, which was not there before. Thank you very much, Victorio. It's a bit hard to hear you, so feel free to chat if you if you have this function available. Also, if you want to add, but thank you for your contribution, much appreciated. Um, there was a very interesting exchange also in the chat, uh, Laura. I don't know if you saw this, but uh, did you see the exchange, which was really putting a bit of a question mark on the consumer panels? Are they are regulators listening to consumers or just talking down to consumers in these panels? So Laura, maybe you want to say something about this. Yes, thank you for that. There were two really good comments, and, and it's a it's a good opportunity to address this. Um, there is a very real risk that you set this up and it just becomes window dressing, and the regulator appears to be listening, but they aren't really. And so, you know, what we heard is, you know, I from the ones who took this really seriously is they stressed. Um, there has to be a sound legal basis that there, you know, there needs to be an obligation for the regulator to listen. Um, and I think the tone from the top, as in many things, is really important. You know, your senior leadership has to be behind this. They have to show that it's respected and valued so that that trickles down throughout the organization. And so the meetings are substantive and the information is actually used and valued. Um, I think also um, there was a mention of capacity, and that's a really a really big precondition for these to work. You know, they all stressed that um, panel members really need to have a strong working knowledge of financial services and financial regulation, and you know what regulators can and can't do, so that they can you know engage as peers and have you know really solid conversations to discuss the issues. Um, and the working groups is a really good idea. I think you know if you can you know, drill down and have small groups that really leverage the expertise of the individual consumer uh, advocate representatives. I think that that's a really great idea too. And I am going to incorporate that more. So thank you for that comment also. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Very good, yeah, I think so. And I think as we continue this research on uh, consumer panels, I think we should also look at the Korea example more closely. Uh, sounds like a really interesting case. Canada, I know we have looked at closely already, uh, but it's, it's really uh, good. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, maybe just, um, I have one more question for Mariela. Um, what are the conditions for, you know, making this collaboration work between your two, you know, regulatory agencies, Mariela? Do you think there are like, very critical conditions for this collaboration to work that you have already identified, or is it too early to draw decisions, to draw conclusions, sorry? 
uh, I mean, it's still early. However, I think uh, because of this digital environment, things are moving very fast and the risks are affecting people in that way also very fast. So we have also to coordinate and use technology both because we cannot continue working on a traditional way. We have to work together and we have tried to catch up the market. And the only way is just collaborating and working together. Actually, the idea is work, uh, first of all, we two, but includes in the, in the future more institutions, but it's a very ambitious uh, uh, project. Very good. Um, now I have a question for uh, Juan Carlos. How do we choose the tools that fit you know, our specific needs. Like in particular, we have a lot of consumer associations and consumer advocates in the participants. So how, how do you choose the tools? Are there tools that work better than others for consumer associations from your perspective? Yes, definitely. And I think in the end, it, it depends, I think on a couple of key factors. On the one hand, understanding which are the objectives uh, that consumer organizations would like to have, which are, and which are the capacities of the consumer organization in which stage of development they are. And this also helps because their capacity and then resources can be very important determinants of what types of tools they can use. And at one part in our taking action section of the toolkit, we have uh, an interesting graph that indicates uh, which types of tools fit the different, how, how much, of resources and money would demand implementation of different types of tools. And I think if a consumer organization has certain types of, of budget available and certain type of staff available, they can see what of these tools are more uh, reachable in terms of their capacities. And another table that I showed is also important in terms of your objectives and the different tools. So by combining these two graphs, consumer organizations can see where they fit in terms of their own capacities, their own resources, and then the objectives they want to achieve by using tools. And I would add, some of these don't really require a lot of money. And some of them we're talking about right now. In terms of building your capacity to talk about financial services, consumer issues, it requires building your team, strengthening your team so that then you as consumer organization can raise your voice, share concerns, share insights with a consumer authority, develop some internal reports, develop some reports that you can produce with your team on what issues you are observing in the market, what issues you are listening from your consumers. And then you can do a brief report on those consumer insights that might not require a lot of, of uh, resources and data, but that can help you really gather consumer insights, direct consumer insights that the authority would not be able to uh, observe directly. So make sure that you build on your own strengths and the capacity that you already have in place. Okay, I have one question for Mariela. That's my own question that um, I'm thinking of now because you know, you're currently, uh, all the other panelists are former regulators but you're currently a regulator. So, you know, I'm, I'm very interested, as you've noticed about this collaboration between not only regulators, but also collaborators, uh, consumer associations and regulators. Do we, we have a lot of consumer advocates on this, you know, uh, uh, in this, in this uh, group of participants. So what would be some of your advice, Mariela, in terms of how to, Create a better, you know, dialogue between regulators and uh, consumer associations. Do you have any specific experience, um, and you know, where you you think you have some recommendation from your side, both both for regulators and for consumer associations, on how to better engage with each other? Okay, this is a, a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I should have warned you. <laughs> I mean, in, uh, in my own experience, when we wrote these uh, measures in the National Policy for Financial Inclusion, 
we see together not only in the copy and the superintendents, we also invited uh, consumer associations because we have to understand what is happening in the market and why uh, the financial services are the, the leaders in number of complaints in the country. So uh, we discussed within the copy, I mean, they impose a, a lot of sanctions. We develop the regulation, I don't know, so, so fast as we can. However, it's, I mean, it's, it's very complicated just to, to feed people uh, expense, expectations on, or, 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 right, or try to understand what they are doing. Actually, when we develop in the past uh, the regulation, we are also clients. So we sit together and all of us were discussing our experience and we yeah, were very, very close. I, 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 I don't know how to say, yes, to, to, to say, yes, put this in the regulation because this cannot be, cannot be done by any institutions without any a whole analysis, yes, because of our own experiences. So we, it's very difficult to deal with it. So we just eliminated this risk or trying to eliminate this. I think all of our uh, consumer or market conduct uh, regulation is supported by uh, different uh, diagnoses and assessments, just trying to eliminate the, the sense of just one person that is the one that's signing the, the regulation. But uh, what I can say is that it's important to listen people. It's, and it's important that regulator try to to understand people and try to speak in a simple way because a consumer regulation or market conduct regulation is also complicated because it's, it's, it's to regulate institutions that speak the same language as a regulator. But when we sit together with in the copy, we start to have problems because we speak different languages. We have different understanding of everything we write. So we have to sit together, it's not other way, trying to understand what we were looking for. And because when, when I think who have to be closer to, 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 uh, to consumers, probably the General Consumer Protection Agency in the case of Peru, uh, because of our legal framework. And the regulator must be close within the copy, otherwise, we cannot uh, understand what's happening in the market and we cannot correct anything. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mayra. That's extremely useful and you know, having clear language and all this sounds like uh, one of the ingredients for, for success. Um, there was uh, one question about the costs of establishing, I, if possible, we'd like to ask Victoria to answer the same question I asked Mariela, you know, what, what can we do to make this dialogue work? Um, if it's too difficult to hear you, Victoria will ask you to type it in the comments. But let's let's try to uh, to hear you if you have any advice on how to, you know, make this dialogue work. Okay, so I think we'll let you put it in the chat, and I'll ask the last question to Laura. Um, so Laura. You know, I think there was a question from Antonino, um, a bit related to the one, you know, Juan Carlos addressed in terms of the costs. So we all know that consumer associations don't have very deep pockets. So how does it work with these consumer panels? Do they get, you know, paid for this uh, consumer representatives or do they get reimbursed of their expenses? What's, what's the tradition? Yeah, it varies um, in part by how much time is required for a participant. You know, there are some where there's a really deep time commitment, so it's more like a, a paid board position. And so there's, you know, a stipend that's sort of a, a significant amount. In most cases, travel is always covered, although during COVID, the meetings were almost always virtual. So that went away. And then there's usually a small honorarium. I was told that, and of course, we mostly spoke with high income countries. And so, you know, this is very different. And this is something we need to go deeper in for low and middle income countries that the money really wasn't a driver that, you know, it was the ability to participate that was really what was attractive to members. But there does need to be um, a recognition that, you know, it is time away, especially for people who are attending as individuals. 
And there also is um, a need for research. You know, there, we notice that not very many um, put money behind research, which is a really important need. And so, you know, this could be another area where additional funding would be helpful to support consumer association research budgets, so. Right. Well, we're reaching 29 and we have one minute left. So I'd like to thank these amazing panelists uh, for this, uh, this great work and also all the participants for all their questions. And last but not least, the impeccable organization by Consumers International, who is a very uh, important partner for CGAP and all of you. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll stay in touch and ho hopefully help uh, build a world with better consumer protection for digital finance. Thank you so much and have a lovely evening, day or morning. Bye-bye.